what we're going to talk about this afternoon is I don't think healthcare is unique in that it is like other fields um, subject to waves of groupthink. Um, people go to the same meetings, uh, they hear talks, they repeat what they hear in those talks, and that groupthink morphs into a consensus about what's happening in the field without a lot of direct connection to data. Um, and that's troublesome to me because I believe not only that health policy ought to be data driven and and propositions about what's going on in the field be subject to empirical test, but also that strategy in institutions like this ought to be data driven and subject to empirical test. So that's the challenge that um, that I'm going to lay out uh, for you now. And it's, of course, you, everybody knows what's going to happen to our health system, right? Everybody knows health costs are growing out of control. And in order to control them, we have to change how doctors, hospitals, and other caregivers are paid. Our health system's payment models are moving from volume to value, are moving from per incident payment to population-based payment. And that if care systems are to cope with these changes, we're going to have to change our emphasis from treatment to prevention. <clears throat> Our health system, rather than being characterized by fragmented, um, a, a fragmented structure of, of hospitals and physician groups and health plans, is going to evolve into models of integrated uh, care where the very same organizations that deliver hospital care also employ physicians and insure patients. Um, due to the press of time, we're not going to be able to get to this one. Disruptive technologies will undermine the traditional business of health care, force transformative change. And then finally, <clears throat> consumer empowerment will strengthen the role of consumer choice in the health system and rearrange the power relationships in medicine, shifting more power to, to the patient. Um, but what if the crowd is wrong? Um, well, I, I think it is. And, and the question I'm going to be asking this afternoon is, well, what difference does it make? Suppose these things don't happen. What does that change for clinicians, for patients, and for large complex institutions like this one. Um, well, here's the first one. Health costs are rising uncontrollably, and to control those costs, we have to change how care is paid for. Um, we've been told incessantly that we need to, to bend the curve. That is, we need to reduce the rate of increase in health spending. This uh, purple dotted line is the curve everyone's talking about. You do not need a doctorate in statistics to see that it is, in fact, bent. It bent down 13 years ago in 2003. And by 2009, reached a level that basically we haven't seen, a level of increase we haven't seen since Dwight Eisenhower was president of the United States, five years before Medicare. It stayed there for five years at this pre-Medicare rate of increase. And of course, if you take out population growth and inflation, this is virtually a dead stop. Um, now, we, we busted the trend a little bit in 14. According to CMS, we bumped up to about 5.8%. But when you look at what produced that deflection, you see the core of the health system, the 60% represented by hospitals in blue and physicians and clinical services in this sort of sick yellow color, uh, remained in the low 4% range. Uh, the biggest contributor to that increase was an 18.5% increase in the federal share of Medicaid, which was driven by Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act. 18.5% to expand the Medicaid program with 100% federal participation. The other big outliers that drove this average up were the cost of government administration. Again, getting ready for uh, the Affordable Care Act at about 8% a year, a big increase from 12 to 13. A single drug, Sovaldi, the hep C drug, followed closely by Harvoni, the combination therapy, this really was a single drug, uh, the biggest blockbuster drug we've seen in our professional lifetimes. Um, and uh, the biggest contributor of all in absolute dollars, the net cost of health insurance, <clears throat> which is the spread between what health insurers charge in premiums and what they pay out to all to deliver care. Um, it's important to add that even with the expansion in coverage that we got in 13 and 14, that 
uh, the core cost in the health system remained at that roughly 4% level. So you know, to argue, and, and remembering fee-for-service, um, the alleged reason why health costs have been growing out of control for most of our professional lifetimes so was pretty much intact the entire time. Um, so I have trouble with the diagnosis that the principal driver of health spending was the way in which we pay doctors and hospitals. I think there were other things at work. Um, and of course, a social scientist, you know, a sociologist or whatever, a political scientist might disagree with an economist on, on what the root cause was. These were, I think, temporary contributors to, the, um, uh, to that uh, uh, decline in the rate of growth. I say temporary because they've largely passed. Uh, and these were the big um, uh, suppressors a pause in device and, and imaging innovation. I think a, a big sleeper here is the retirement of an entire generation of 80 hour a week uh, workaholic baby boomer docs. Um, a big shift in risk to consumers through almost a quintupling in uh, a high deductible health plan enrollment. And I think lurking in the background and the biggest uh, suppressing force of all, what I call the affordability problem, 